On this week's episode, we sit down with Matthew Burton. Originally from Cold Lake, Alberta, Matthew moved to Dartmouth at a young age and has been on the East Coast ever since. After high school, he decided to enlist in the Royal Canadian Navy. But after five years as a naval weapons engineering technician, Matthew realized he wasn't content with his career and he left the armed forces. He then spent two years at NSCC to attain a business diploma with a concentration in finance. However, after a brief stint with a local hedge fund, he began realizing that this wasn't for him either. Now, Matthew has monetized his love for photography and videography and is currently planning the launch for his media company, Loud Media. Listen in as Matt takes us through it all. I was the same old me With the same old blues I was the same old me With the same old blues I was the same old me All right, so we're back for another episode of Brand New View. How's it going, Ben? Very well. Great day. Glad to hear you. You have been having a good day. Very good day. So things have been going well. Excited to have Matthew Burton join us here tonight. How you doing, Matthew? Good, man. Excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah, happy to have you. Just Matthew, a couple guys. Uh, just, just a couple just guys a, hanging, a, hanging in a bachelor pad. Just a couple. couple. <laughs> Mello's joining us. He's having some uh, some cabin right now. Mm-hmm. Hopefully he'll Getting be... Getting his uh, feast on. Nice and calm for the whole full episode here. So, Matt, you are originally from Alberta, but you grew up in Dartmouth. Correct, yeah. When did you move to Dartmouth? 2000. 2000? Yeah. Okay, so you did spend a Yeah, I spent about eight years in, in a town called Cold Lake. It's like a military oh. base, like an Air Force base. Okay, what yeah. was it like growing up in Cold Lake? Terrible. Where exactly Shit, is eh? Cold Lake? Actually. It's kind of like... It's, I guess it's almost like central Alberta, I mm-hmm. guess, as far as the height of the province. Yeah. And it's kind of the, the lake itself crosses into the Saskatchewan border. Sweet. Okay. All right. Yeah, huge lake. But yeah, not a whole lot there. I mean, there's a Canex, which is kind of like the military shopping spot. And then uh, a Robin's Donut, an Ooh. IGA, and a Zeller's. <laughs> I IGA. love that you hit up coffee second on and the list. Like, independent we didn't have grocers. a Tim's. We, we had a Robin's. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, what's the population of Cold Lake. Oh man, I don't know. It's small. I mean, it's definitely a lot bigger now. But I mean, back then it couldn't have been, couldn't have been more than like ten thousand people. Ten thousand, okay. And what brought you to the to the East Coast? My old man was in the Air Force, so he he got posted to Shearwater, and then he finished off his his contract there before he he retired. So okay, he, yeah, cool. we got sent here in two thousand, and I've been here ever since. Minus a two year stint in Newfoundland, I moved up there for a bit. Did you? Okay. Yeah. So am I doing my math correctly? That would that would have made you eight when you moved here. Yeah, definitely. I was I was eight. Yeah, freshly eight. What uh, what kind of interest did you have growing up? Honestly, like I don't know if I'm the only one who experiences this, but I feel like I don't have any memories earlier than twelve. Interesting. You know, I mean, there's there's a brief period when I was a child. This is this is the I guess the first tidbit of juiciness. There I was, we go. I was paralyzed from the waist down. Oh wow. What? Yeah, crazy, right? When I was uh, five, I think. Now, that's pretty much one of the few memories other than like a couple Polaroids of like really random things that you, you wonder why you're remembering this type of memory, right? Oh, Back up, yeah. dog. But yeah, for yeah. the folks out there, he's walking now. Yeah, he's so. walking. Oh, yeah, I got... Uh, what happened? Yeah, I, use, I use that as an excuse sometimes why I don't train legs often. It's like, no, when I was a kid, I was paralyzed. I'm still working on some things. Holy but, um, smokes, what happened? Yeah, I, I honestly don't even really know. It was some weird viral infection that attacked like the ligaments, muscles, and bone wow. um, in my legs and it just essentially just rendered them useless i was in a wheelchair couldn't walk had to learn how to walk again and it was about three or four months testing in the children's hospital like blood work every week um one thing i, I vividly remember is they used to do this like um electrostatic test i think it was um and they looked like these two old school ink cartridges with these massive needle probes at the end and they would jab them into both my quads and they would just send electrical impulses to like stimulate the muscles. Yeah. Now the worst part about this whole thing is although I was paralyzed from the waist down, I couldn't use my legs. I still had full feeling and sensation in them. Oh, so I could crazy. feel everything they were doing, all it's the like needles, the scene all the probes. From, uh, uh, Law-abiding citizen. No. No. Maybe. Because uh, that was a messed up scene. <laughs> it's Will Ferrell. Don't you stab him, Ricky Bobby, in the leg, and oh. then he says, "Oh, Talladega Nights." That's where your mind goes. And he just goes. screams, <laughs> "No!" When they're all in the wheelchairs playing basketball, and he jumps up and just spikes the ball at that one guy, it's yeah. like, how does he not know he can walk? Right? My legs. <laughs> oh, that's um, so good. No, I, the reason I was thinking of that actually, uh, I was 
I'm the type that when I hear of certain things like that, like if you're like jabbing into the quads, like my body feels it then. Just all of that muscle. And I was like, oh, like that really like yeah, bugged me Yeah, it's very right? uncomfortable. Well, like yeah. when, when, I, when it first happened and, you know, I didn't know this until I was older because, you know, at five years old, you're not really paying attention to what doctors are saying. Uh, but my folks said that the doctor's first like initial um, idea was the fact that I might have had cancer in the bones of my legs or, or somewhere in my legs. And they said, you know, the one of the courses of action might be to actually just amputate both legs. And I was like, and when I found that, I was like, man, I'm so glad that didn't happen. You know, that, wow. that would have easily set me on a completely different life trajectory, right? Who yes. knows what I'd be doing at that point. Wow. That was right. Well, yeah. Didn't see that one coming, did you, man? Right out of left field. Eh? Right out of yeah. left field. Start strong. And you said that that was one of the, the few memories you have of that time in Cold Lake. Yeah, which is weird. I don't, I don't, again, like, I think it just comes back to the whole thing, like, you know, maybe it's like, well, your brain is still developing. You only yeah, remember, it's like, so tough. but there's weird things. Like, I'll remember super specific, not life defining moments whatsoever about just that time. Moments. Like, I have this one memory where my father, me, and my brother, like, we lived across the street from the school we went to, and they had, back when they had sandboxes all over the playground. Those are the days. My old man literally went out with a shovel and dug this sandbox like four or five feet deep. And we're in there, and then we're just making these tunnels for all these like little toy cars and tractors we have. And then some guy in the neighborhood came over and was like, we can't be doing that, and he called the cops on us. <laughs> and the cops came, the cops like, man, fuck that guy, don't worry about that. It's like, you guys just keep doing what you're doing. He goes, you're just having fun with your, your two sons, right? And like it's weird that I have that memory, right? It hasn't affected me at all. Maybe it's just like a genuinely such a happy, good memory with my father and brother, but I mean. A good moment. Yeah. So I guess coming into your your teens, did mm. you did you um, hone into something in particular, school subject wise, or or was it anything? Like no, that? I I feel like on the side of I guess I'll label it as something that I was genuinely passionate about. That was like a very late discovery in life for me, and, and that does revolve around like the arts, photography, and film. Mm-hmm. That's something that I didn't really develop until I was probably twenty four, twenty five, and I'm I'm only twenty seven now, right? So it's a, you know, I think from a lot of younger people that I talk to, I'm, I'm a pretty good example. And there's examples that are later than me as well, who, you know, you don't have to find out what you love and what you want to do right now. You know, it's okay to, to feel lost for a while. Like I felt lost up until I was 26, right? Mm-hmm. Last year was the first, like a, not even fully a year ago was the first point in my life. Where I'm like, wow, I know what I want to do, how I'm going to start doing it. And the steps I need to take to kind of achieve these things and genuinely started making decisions for myself and feeling good about that. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, I just kind of felt like I was not coasting through life, but I was just existing almost. Like I didn't really feel like anything I was doing was of great benefit to many people. Like I tried my best to do as many kind of acts as possible when I was younger, um, when I wasn't being like a neighborhood nuisance with the, the kids I rolled around with. Like <laughs> we did a few questionable things, but... Um, We're still doing those things. Yeah. So I find it interesting that until you found kind of the, the videography and the mm. photography in, in your mid twenties that you felt lost. And, and because I kind of felt the same way where nothing necessarily was a huge challenge to overcome mm. in terms of school, but there was no end goal. There was no real direction and same kind of thing. It was just, mm. you know, we're just existing. You know, we have our friends, we have our family we're doing well to the, to the naked eye, mm. but there's just, there's no feeling inside really in terms of you know, passion for a career. Mm. It's almost like a lack of feeling like yeah. you're, you're, you're unaware of the fact that you're longing for something more. You're mm-hmm. just, you didn't, you don't really know what you're missing until you, you kind of find out what you're mm. missing. Right. And like you, yeah. you said about just kind of existing, it got to a point in my life when I was just like, there's, there's gotta be more. Mm. Like I was the kind of guy that would start every morning with a motivational video and I still do it from time to time, but I do it a lot less now that I'm trying to, to practice what I really believe in, right? It's it's one thing to get motivated off this stuff, but it's another thing, another thing entirely to have like the discipline and determination to actually go and do these things, mm-hmm. right? So, hardest yeah, part. I just yeah, action, right? I just got to that snapping point where I was so frustrated. I'm like, no, I was like this. Kid, I was like, I was I was working at this this firm in Halifax. I'm sitting behind these these like I had two monitors. I'm handling trades for these these funds, and dealing with like investor queries i'm just looking up and it's like a cubicle farm and people headphones in you know lucky enough like i was able to listen to podcasts so i had like joe rogan's podcast and all the time bnv jre so i'm just doing all this stuff and um i'm like 
looking up and I see everyone sitting there with like the same emotionless expression. I'm like, man, it's like this is not a life I want to be a part of, right? It's like I got to do something that's like different almost every day. I, I want to be able to come and go as I please and, and not just like float through carelessly and just have things handed to me, like work really hard to get to a place where I can kind of pick and choose what I do with my spare time mm-hmm. and, and my time to kind of provide for myself. Mm-hmm. And just not be held down by that, that Monday to Friday, nine to five, that idea to me felt so restrictive like i'll put oh, in the same yeah. amount of hours yeah but just all over the place almost that's more now though, right yeah, like when you find true. something you want to do it's like the nine to five is gone but now it's like a seven to seven type right, thing, right? Yeah. but it doesn't feel like that because it's something you oh, genuinely it's like 24 like 7 thing 100 mm-hmm. yeah. percent. and Where you I, don't feel the need to punch it. in punch out no that's what drives me nuts about my job i will speak on this because i don't normally with work mm. but with my nine to five right now i can complete the work in less than 40 hours mm-hmm. so why why are you guys pinning me here yeah why am yeah. i hemmed in yeah. they're like yeah you can't leave yet i'm like but i'm fucking done mm. like what what do you mean i can't leave okay get your like, you gotta hey, get we're your paying hours for 40 like, hours but yeah. i can complete the work in half the time yeah <laughs> it should almost be like pay based off of work needed to be completed as mm-hmm. opposed to hours logged but then we'd all be working forever we'd all look for that 80 hours at the at the dollar rate right yeah, that's fair. Get as much i don't know i think a four-day work week is a good start yeah. Um, okay. Just, think just of what it would of... do to yeah. Think of what it would do to your psyche to switch to from a five day that you've been working for five years. Mm-hmm. Then the next five years is a four day. How much happier are you? I, I well the thing is that I can't Infinitely. really speak I can. on that because I've you know I've served I, I worked at a marketing firm last mm-hmm. year for or a media company I guess it was for a month mm-hmm. and it was just yeah I I'd never felt so trapped. anxious and yeah. trapped it was. Horrific. Mm-hmm. I was so anxious. Other than that, I've been serving and just going to school. So I've never yeah. really had that Monday to Friday, nine to five. But I feel like just that <clears throat> extra day for the people who are in that grind <clears throat> would just do wonders. I mean, oh. there's already places in Europe doing it. Yeah, most of the Scandinavian countries. Yeah, I was about to say a lot of the Scandinavian countries, yeah. they, they do that. Yeah. yeah. I, but, I fact check, but like it's probably like Finland, Sweden, one of those two for sure. They're usually the trendsetters like, for stuff like yeah. that, like free universities. Yeah, but then look at their mental right? health. We were speaking about this off camera. Like it's probably th- it's probably the best in, in the UK. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. okay, it's yeah. crazy. I wonder if there's a you know. And considering the lack of sunlight up there, mm. like they're doing pretty well for themselves. Yeah, work less, be happier. I want to go back for a hot second. Um, I don't know if it's come up before on air or off air, but there's a there's a point that you mentioned and I just wanted to touch it for a second but you said you felt lost mm-hmm. but you knew exactly where you were mm-hmm. so is that lost or you just weren't where you wanted to be I would almost use the analogy that if someone dropped me off in the middle of London never been mm-hmm. I could look around like I know I'm in London but I don't know where I'm at you know what I mean mm-hmm. so technically not lost I like that Yeah, I like that a lot mm-hmm. too and and you would eventually have the ability to to know where to go. Yep. Find your way. Yeah. So, did you feel like you were dropped off in London, or you felt like you were dropped off in the middle of nowhere? Um, I would say a, a bit of both. There were certain points in my life where I was in situations that it's almost like I was in a bit of a daze, and one day I would snap, and be like, "How did I get here?" Right. And now that I'm here, obviously I found the way in, but I can't see the way out. Like, where's my next logical step to help me through this situation? Right. But then there's other times where I know exactly where I'm at, but it was the actions I take or I, I the actions I took based off of what I thought others wanted me to do, mm-hmm. right? Or what like society had deemed the next appropriate step for someone of my age, like graduate high school, boom, mm-hmm. apply to university, get accepted, boom, select your degree, start going, right? Like We're I did that whole thing right out of high school, boom, at university, one semester, and it was like, man, this is a waste of time and money for me. Dropped out, boom, right into the military because my father did it, my brother did it, my cousin did it. And I saw the stability that offered. And at a young age, I was I was all about money, right? And I knew that was a fast way to get money and get a lot of it. So that was my natural progression because I kind of went into a bit of a panic state. All my friends at the time had the degree that they knew what they wanted to do, right, and pursue. And I'm sitting here like, man, I have no idea. I can't be the only one that's like this, this confused and lost. So I went the way my Definitely dad and brother did because they were kind of happy and they had money, right? So I was like, cool, let's just do that. So I did that for five years. And then it's funny because even after serving my time in the military, getting out, going back to school, getting another job I didn't like and starting my own thing, I still have friends, those same friends who still don't know what they want to do. And I'm like, 
I wasn't the only one at that point who didn't know what they wanted to do. I was just the only one really questioning myself at that point. They hadn't right. gone to that point where they're like, what's happening, right? You see a lot of that now. I mean, people that in university seemed like they knew where they were mm-hmm. going. And for me in particular, I had no idea. But, you know, jump 10 years in, in the future, I kind of kind of get an idea of hmm. what I'm doing. And, and some of those people are just completely lost. Yeah. They have no idea what's I, going I felt on. like I was being forced to figure it out at a time where I simply wasn't ready to figure it out. Yeah. How can you be qualified at 17 years old to make like this $60,000 decision? Why does it even right? have to be decided upon by your age? Like yeah. at 21, you could look at me and be like, dude was pretty immature at, at 21. Like, Dude, Not I was immature at like 23, 24. Yeah, right? no, no, but like comparatively like oh, to yeah. other 21 year olds, like, yeah, sure, I'm still 21, they're 21, mm. but I probably wasn't at the same maturity mm. level. Like, And then you look around the room and I'm like, there's probably people that, none of us are at the same maturity level. There's probably people that are more mature than me. Yeah. Honestly, we could have a day long, not even a decades long conversation and the educational system puts everyone into one box. But, but that's, oh. that, that's where I'm going to with the one box. Yeah. It's like I felt so forced to figure it out while everyone else was trying to figure it out. And I was just like looking around being like, you know, I was standing still. Everything else was moving so quickly around me. I was like, I simply cannot figure this out right mm-hmm. now. Like I'm just not ready. Mm-hmm. Like, but I'm forced to. So yeah, I'll do option A because it looks good. Yeah. The, the amount of people I know and have in my life that either aren't doing some sort of field of work that was related to their field of study in university <clears throat> or just have completely say abandoned their degree gone back to get a trade and did that is astronomical i think I'm, i think out of everyone that i've come across in my life maybe two people that i that i know on on some form of, of personal level are actually doing something related to their field of study mm-hmm. right because i find a lot of people it's it's kind of a shame that a lot of people find themselves in university while they've already invested so much time and money. And then, then you kind of have that internal conflict with, yeah, I know I don't want to do this, but I'm halfway through or a third of, or two thirds of the way through. Is it worth it just to finish this so I can get, I, I hear so many people go, I'm almost done. I might as well finish it just to get that degree, right. which, I which is spent all fine, this money. right? So I like, I mean, it's fine to a certain extent because a lot of jobs require that degree. Even if, you know, the, and it's so funny because you, you almost never use your, your the knowledge you've, retained from university in that job because everything's on the job training. I kind of want to go back to uh, your time in in the military. What kind of led to leaving? Yeah, so I mean, I guess a lot of these moments in my life come back to that feeling of doing stuff that I thought others wanted me to do and that I thought was the proper trajectory for my life for quote-unquote success or that would get me to that end goal of wife, house, kids, good job, which a lot of people think is kind of what they need out of life, right? Without really trying to figure out what they need in life. Mm-hmm. So Don't you hate that? Uh, brutal. One box. So Grass I got box. that job. They sent me up to, and this is when I went to Newfoundland. They, they sent me to Newfoundland for two years to do electromechanical engineering at uh, Marine Institute, which is like a subsidiary of uh, Memorial University. So I did that for two years. Um, Sweet deal. They paid for my education. They paid me to go, and they paid for my apartment for where I was living at. Right. So I mean, That's how can you say no? <laughs> yeah, when you're 19 years old and someone offers you that, you're like, done. Let's go. Yeah. And it was a quick process. Um, you know, they called me. I think on like December 4th um, of like 2011. Yeah, 2011. And no, 2010, I think. Anyways, they said. You know, there's one spot left in this program. If you want it, it's yours. I'm like 100%. When when do we start? And I'm like, well, can you come in and get sworn in on the eighth? I'm like, in four days. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, sure. And then I'll be in the military. They're like, yeah. I'm like, cool. I'm like, and then we're gonna fly you out on the tenth to do your orientation to the school. I'm like, oh, like in in six days, so like less than a week. I'm gonna go from being a civilian with no job to being a military service member on my way to orientation for electromechanical engineering program in Newfoundland. So I was like, yeah, let's go, right? Let's just hit the go button. I went for it. So I did that. It was pretty good. Bit of a, a awakening, I guess, because it's my first time moving away from home uh, without family or friends, let alone a different province where I knew literally nobody. And I had a roommate who I'd met for the first time in an apartment in a city I'd never been in. So I did that for two years, and it was it was good. Like I, I really enjoyed my time, learned a lot about myself, found some new hobbies. Um, I was I was pretty good at the program we did. And the th- 
it was five semesters total in the third semester. That was like the defining moment that before that third semester started, you could just be like, I don't think I want to do this. And they would just release you from the military. You'd be out of your contract and then fly you home, pay for everything. But the moment you started that third semester, you were locked in your contract. Mm-hmm. Meaning that where they were paying for two years of school for you, you owed them two years of service for every year in school. So you, you six year contract total. It's a pretty big commitment, right? You know, <coughs> at that time you're kind of disguised by all this stuff's being paid for. I have a great paycheck. I have all these benefits and I get to travel the world on a ship. It's great. Let's do it. So without hesitation, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this. I, I can't wait. Let's go. So I finished the program. Then it came to the posting season at the school and 60% of the students got to go back to Halifax and 40% had to go to the West coast of Victoria. Um, Kind of tense because about 90% of everybody want to go to Halifax mm. and like only 10% want to go to BC. So there was a couple hard decisions made by the the chief of our detachment there to send some people to BC. Everything kind of worked out in the end. But um, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to get back to Halifax. So I got posted here and started doing like my actual job training because everything before that didn't really have much to do with the military. It had some like applicable knowledge from some of the programs onto some of the stuff on ship. But again, it came back to what we're saying. The majority of the stuff you learn in tasks, you, you learn that in a service you in your job were mm-hmm. learned on the job through on the job training. That's clutch. Yeah, it's still kind of cool that I, I have a, a civilian diploma now in electromechanical engineering that I will probably never use. But I mean, it's cool to have on the wall, right? It's a little conversation yeah, starter. You, gotta, you know, hey, we're talking about it right now. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I, I did that for a couple of years. And the more and more I was doing on the job training, I just realized there wasn't, a lot of things I was told that I was going to be doing for my job didn't come to fruition. You know, it was a lot of, you get to do this, 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 and this. And it turns out I could really only kind of do this. And like under certain circumstances when things are going really well, do this, right? A lot of like hurry up and wait, yeah. which is, which really got to like me because I, I, I need to be doing something. And then the whole aspect of sailing, like it's, it's a lot worse and more drab than I personally thought. Some people love it. And, and can do it and I mean you know I commend anyone who can go away for six months and be at sea and you know stop in these random countries for like maybe 48 72 hours right and if you're lucky maybe four days and even then you have duty watches in between where you can't yeah. leave the ship and then on top of that like yeah, I'm over here shaking my shaking head, my head. oh yeah no. like her, no. it just it was hard you know like you, you you're always you you're always your own person but there's definitely limitations put on when you're you're serving in, in the Navy and the military as a whole. Like if I wanted to go away for the weekend at my buddy's cottage, the, the same one we're going to in like two weeks' time, I'd have to fill out a lead pass, submit that to my chain of command, have to get passed up all the way to the CO. He'd have to approve it, come back down and be like, hey, you know, you're you're approved to go on vacation. I'm like, cool, right? That's great. And then there's so many other extra just sailor duties, things you had to do as a sailor outside of your trade. Um, and certain duty watches that you had to do until you reached a certain seniority on ship or a certain rank where, you know, just the people below you do that. And it was all these things building up with like lack of gratification from my job, all the time away from home, um, having it like affect any relationship I was trying to start just because, you know, it, it's hard to start a relationship for like a couple weeks, a couple months, and then you're gone for like a couple weeks, a couple months, right? Just not a lot of people want to sign up for that. Um, and just the, the lifestyle really didn't mesh well with what I wanted to do, right? Like, I, I don't know if I have like an authoritative problem, but just being told I have to shave every day and my hair can't touch my ears, oh, it just drove me absolutely crazy. So I was getting really frustrated. I'm like, I, I got to get out of this situation, right? But I'm locked in for a six-year contract, right? I still have like two and a half years left. And at this point, I'm like, man, like, I can't do it. Like, I, I actually can't do this. Like, I'm, I'm spending... I, I hate when people have to do this. I'm working for Friday, which is the worst mentality, mentality to have. Like, if you're working for Friday, man, you're doing something wrong with your life. You need to yeah. get out of the situation as soon as possible. And just, even if it's not something you want to do, try something different. Get yourself out of that environment to give yourself like an unbiased look at your life as a whole and try and just, you know, even. Again, if, if it's something you don't want to do, still do it because finding out who you are not is literally just as important as finding out who you are, right? Crossing off those boxes like, yeah, I don't like this. I don't like that. Like doing one thing you don't like could cross off like 10 boxes for all you know, right? Or you Absolutely. might even somehow stumble into something you love through doing something you hate, Yeah, right? Could open up a lot more boxes. Yeah, mm-hmm. whether that's through meeting people or other experiences. So I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm in a dilemma. I'm like, man, it's like I, I got to find a way out. 
and I the, the only way that I was told is that you have to pay back all the money they spent in school. And someone threw out a figure. I don't know how accurate this is, but they're like, it's like a hundred and something thousand dollars you have to pay them. Whew. Right? I'm like, that's just unrealistic. Right? I'm going to be in debt for the rest of my life. It's like, I'm not doing that. So I was lucky enough to be selected for a ceremonial posting for a month and a half. Um, they flew me to Ottawa and I, have you guys been to Ottawa? Mm-hmm. You know, like oh, the, yeah. the war memorial in the center of town. Yep. So I did the whole honor guard there. I stood still with the rifle and like do the whole like parade there. I, I ran it. by guys like you all the time. Yeah. I did that for about a month and a half. Um, and that was a great experience. Like that whole aspect of the military, like the paying homage to, to fallen soldiers and just really being a part of that culture of, of, respect for what the military has done whether it was you yourself or just people before you but just being a part of that organization that body does bring forth a sense of pride even if you you don't support her you don't want like you you do feel a lot of pride Mm -hmm. so while i was doing that i was lucky enough to meet my career counselor in person it's typically like a skype call or a video conference call you never meet them in person but i was in ottawa and they're just like you know what you're here do you want to meet your career career counselor in person i was like yeah definitely i was like i'd like to chat about some ideas and at this point I've been going through my contract, right? Like this thick, beefy contract. Cause I'm like, there's gotta be loophole, right? <laughs> every movie I watch, every TV show I watch, there's always loophole, right? Some lucky son of a bitch finds a way out early. And I did, which is the funny part. <laughs> so I was going through my contract. It wasn't actually every year of school is two years of service. It's every day in class is two days of service. So right away, I can knock off my work term because it wasn't time in class. It's a whole semester. I was able to knock off the two Christmas breaks, uh, my summer leave, the summer vacation, um, holidays, weekends, stuff like that. And that shaved what off. What was that math like? No. <laughs> like 100 days? T- uh, no, it shaved off uh, a year and a month. Wow. What? Well, yes. A year and a month of my contract. Yeah, that's incredible. From six to five years. I was thinking like, yeah, you're taking a week here, a week there, but then summers, a couple months. No, so I got out. Uh, I got out in September of 2016, and I shouldn't have been able to get out till um, the December of the following year. Damn. Good for you. Yeah. And so then... I told my career counselor. I told him what my plan was. So I took no vacation, none of my block leave for my last year in the military. I saved it all for the end because school was starting September 6th or 7th and I wasn't allowed to get out till like September 23rd. So then I took all of my vacation for throughout the month of September. So like for my first month of school, I, I was still in the Navy getting paid from the government, but I was a student. So uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to find that. But going back to, to the reason why I left is like, I just felt too restricted. I... I rapidly found out as soon as like that contract set in i was supposed to ship i just like felt these walls get a little bit closer every couple months these walls were getting closer and closer and i had less and less reach less and less mobility and I, I felt like i was losing myself a little bit more and more each each month you lose your autonomy yeah it's exactly what it is and i mean that was the first time that i actually went and i talked to a psychiatrist of the military because i'm like i just need help because again i'm spending all week working for friday and when i get to friday i'm like yeah it's the weekend but then as soon as Saturday morning hits, I, I got like weirdly depressed because I'm like, fuck, like, this is the last day of my weekend because when I go to bed Saturday, I wake up at Sunday. Sunday's my last day and then work falls on Monday. Clocks has started. Yeah, I right? was the same way. As soon as Friday came, it's almost like it wasn't like, yeah, it's the weekend. It was like for maybe, maybe a brief second, I'm like, yeah, it's the weekend. But then boom, that clock starts. I'm like, what do I do with this time? Like, yeah. what, what can I what can I achieve? Like, how can I be me in like these 48 to 72 hours, all right? And then you have no plans that Saturday morning. It's just you having a coffee, which would seem pretty normal, but you're like, man, this is a bummer. Like, I'm wasting time. Yeah, I'm wasting- and then before you know it, it's Saturday night, right? Exactly. Like, I hate shit, that feeling. More Sunday. When it, when it goes Why past three in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's like 360 from where we're at now. Like, right now, like, I don't even have a Monday through Sunday. Like, I, 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 and I, I can take so much pride in saying this. Like, I just have days now. Mm-hmm. Like, there's just another day towards my goal. Like, I, it doesn't matter if it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. What I need to get done today is what I'm going to do today, right? I, would, and I, I'm, I'm privileged enough to be able to live a lifestyle like that currently. But, yeah, something to be said to, to not living for the weekend anymore and just having, like, your whole week as your week, mm-hmm. right? Right. If you live for the weekend, then that, that kind of bleeds into living for the, you know, the afternoons, the evenings, as soon as you're off work. And then that, that it just, 
you're almost it's worse not and living worse at that point, yeah, right? You're, you're trying so hard to live for these moments, but living, you're really just yeah. not living at all. But you rationalize it with, well, yeah. how else am I going to afford that or, or live for those moments if I yeah. don't have a job? And that's the thing is that's that's people trap themselves with thinking, yeah. you know, I'm at a lifestyle A. Like, I don't want to drop down to lifestyle B, C, or D. Like, I, I need this money. Money, I like, I need it to keep my lifestyle. And I was the exact same way. My last year in the military, I think I was making $72,000 a year. Wow. Right? Great money. Full benefits. Four weeks vacation. Amazing. And I'm someone who, who like, even to this day, like, I'm still obsessed with money. I love money. I want to make more money and save money to secure my retirement. But it was the easiest decision to walk away from that paycheck to go make minimum wage at the clothing store and pay for tuition for, for college. Easiest. Like, it was it was initially hard, and that was probably still probably the only aspect of the military that I miss to, to a certain extent. But in those moments, leading to making that much to making minimum wage part time and pay, and having more bills to pay than when I was in the military, it was this weird sense of euphoria in the fact that it hit me like a train. I realized in that exact moment, money is literally not happiness. At that point, I was so much more mentally healthier and stronger than I've ever been in my entire life. And I was making maybe, maybe a sixth, a seventh of what I was making before. I'd be, I was probably lucky to crack like 15000 at a part-time job, yeah. down from seventy two. But man, I was way happier. And it was weird because I, I was, I feel like most college university students who are working part-time to pay for everything, you're, you're stressed out, right? You have anxiety about money. But like, it's almost like my happiness every day was just trumping that. Like I'm just like, yeah, this sucks, but fuck yeah, this is great, right? Because I, I felt like I had myself back. I felt like I was, I was me again. Yeah, you were doing life on your terms. 100%. I mean, and that was the first decision I made for myself was to get out of the military, didn't really consult a whole lot of people, and the people that I did consult, I took their recommendation with a grain of salt. And then when I went to go back to NSCC for business, again, that was my decision on my term that I wanted to do. And I had so many, like, any, and it's funny because the times I make these decisions for myself are the ones when people have the most to say. Even when I was going back to school, people like primarily people in the military and authoritative figures there. I'll never forget this one petty officer, this like short French bald dude. Oh man, I like to just like smack the hair back on his scalp. <laughs> when I'm releasing, he goes, "Yeah, you'll be back here in less than twelve months." He goes, "They always come back." He goes, "You think you'll be a success outside civvy side?" He goes, "What kind of skills do you have to take you out?" I'm like, "I'm going back to school for business." He goes, "Yeah, good luck with that. Good luck with getting a job." He goes, "You'll be back. I know you're back." And he's dead serious. He's like, I've seen too many guys like you who think they can make it civvy side after getting the taste of the money in the military. He's like, you'll be back. And like, he's like one of the main motivators. I'm like, you know, fuck you, man. I'm not coming back. And I'm going to be a success. I guarantee it. He's like, you'll, you'll probably never know. use you as a motivator, my right. man. Right. 100%. Just another another person to prove wrong, man, on my on my road, right? So I absolutely love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. Also, I love the imagery, side. too. That's the first time I'm hearing that. City side? I've heard city, city side. Civvy side. Civvy yeah. side. I've never heard that. No, I, I guess just like. Civilization, I yeah. Guess. Well, Civi. civilian, yeah. We're yeah. we're civvy. We're on that. We're on that civvy side. Yeah. Right. No, I get that. Civvy side. Cool. Yeah. So, what led to the decision to head over to NSCC? Um, honestly, I, I just I couldn't picture myself in, in university for four years. Uh, the financial commitment, the time commitment, um, and I feel. How like old were you at this point? I would have been twenty-four. Okay, so mm-hmm. this is fresh out. About yeah, that. fresh out like. The first couple of weeks, I was still a service weeks. member so like while October. I was in NSCC. Oh, wow. Okay. September, October. In yeah. This, this journey. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sitting there and uh, what was the question again? Why uh, NSCC? Why, yeah. Yeah. The the time commitment of, of university just seemed kind of daunting to me because I, I still kind of had that mindset of, man, like I'm getting older. Life needs to start now. So NSCC was two years, boom, in and out, not four years. Another lure that I had to NSCC was the fact that a degree is what? Like, I don't know if this if these are right numbers. Like, a 120 credit hour thing is a degree or yep. something like that? Sounds right. That is right. Yeah. NSCC, it's 60, right? It's 30 over four years, so 120 hours. Yeah. yeah so And we, it even counts as two years of a degree at most of the universities yeah, and in this, Atlanta, this Canada. is the cool thing. So, NSCC is half the time, right? But there's not really elective, so to speak. Everything is, is pretty close to your field of study, if not directly applicable in some way. Mm-hmm. So every course I took was all financial courses mixed in with a bit of marketing, which still helps with finance. Um, and then say like other courses like uh, organizational behavior, which services you in almost any job. OB, like that, OB. Right? So we just called it OB. Yeah. Organizational behavior. Matthew knows. 
<laughs> I knew what it was. Ob. Yeah, but yeah, NSC was just great. Like the, I, I find the the whole community around NSCC just it like cultivates innovation. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a huge advocate for NSCC. I'd love to go back and you know whether it's help out with the university in some capacity or you know grow a business to a point where I can bring on interns, paid interns within their field of study. Or Are just, you guys listening? NSCC. Can NSCC, you hear this? Can you hear me? Yeah, this thing's on, right? Ray Abney, is that you? Come on. Right? Even to go back and do a talk, right? Like, that's like, look, I told one of my instructors, like, one day I was like, I want to come back and give a talk at NSCC. It starts with the shout out, and then we'll get you in. That's it, I right? I know they're listening. That's definitely, well, we had, uh, <coughs> did you have a Luella? No, I didn't. She was she was one of our first uh, no. guests on the, oh, was it? on the pod, yeah. Yeah, she was Barb, in the banking Barb industry. Powers, she was my instructor Barb. for my whole last year. She's, I've never met a woman or even human who's as driven and switched on as she is. Shout like, out, Barb. Oh. A couple shout outs in the last couple yeah. minutes. Yeah. Like, I, I st- I'll still try my best to meet with her every two, three months just to kind of catch up and kind of. I find she's a really good benchmark to kind of, if I'm kind of trying to do too many things or kind of get off track, she's really good at honing me back and be like, no, no, no. Yeah. I was like, you're, you're trying to spread yourself out again. Come back. This is your goal. This is kind of steps you need to kind of keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Keeps me on the straight and narrow and, and really, you know, shooting where I need to shoot, which, which is super crucial, especially. Where I'm someone who like tries to do everything at the same time, so I'm that way. Sometimes you just gotta let the yeah just flow. That's good. So you got your diploma in uh, in finance. Uh, yeah, finance and investment management. And investment management. Yeah. and uh, it's so, just called like business admin because it was like an open concentration. They didn't have an actual title for it. Okay. But um, everything we focused on, like we didn't get to pick any extra classes. Everything was perfectly laid out for us. Right, and and why finance? Was that something you've always had an interest in? Well, or? again, like when I was younger, I just always had like an affinity for money and saving money, and I had this dream of just making my own investment portfolio and, and securing my retirement like early on and mm-hmm. just living the best life I could. So. I like I thought this was the path for me so I'm like let's do it and I loved school loved every aspect of it I didn't realize that what I loved more was I guess the the culture NSCC brought about camaraderie and, yeah exactly and a lot of the other soft skills that I took away which are more crucial than than hard skills I find in a lot of jobs nowadays yeah that I took away from that and like a lot of the things I still utilize on a daily basis that I that I, I've taken away from NSCC don't involve my field of study but those soft skills that I, I've developed from networking, talking with, you know, people um, in positions that can, you know, potentially help me and show how I can help them. And just basically how to carry myself as a professional. So when I had graduated and I hopped in the financial industry, I worked at this this hedge fund company. And then I was like, I was like an eager bee for the first couple of weeks. I'm like, yeah, like this is where I want to be. I didn't want to be at a retail bank. I want to be dealing with like millions and millions and millions of dollars. And that's what I was doing. Talking with these big investors overseas down in the Cayman Islands. Like, man, I was like, this is it, right? I was like, I love it. <clears throat> and then those four walls came back. And my God, was that the most soul crushing experience of my life? Because I was so sure coming out of the military that finance is where I wanted to be, had a stellar two years, right? Like the peak two years of my like formative years, I'm like, this is it. First couple weeks in the job, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've, I've hit it. I hit the nail on the head, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. And then like month two, I'm like, oh, I, fuck, I made another mistake, right? This isn't where I'm supposed to be. So I spent all this money, quote unquote, delayed my life, so to speak, for another two years. And I'm back in the same boat, pun intended, same that I was feeling. with the Navy. So I'm like, oh, how did, I like it when they're intended. I, I like you know, that one. I was like, how did this happen? Right? How did you let this happen? Like, you made this decision for yourself, right? But then I was fooled into thinking that making decisions for myself were always going to be the right decision, right? Now, it helped lead me to the right path. So I guess in, in some weird, you know, backwards riddle way that this kind of was the right decision. But in that moment, I didn't see it as the right decision, so I'm, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm not seeing much job progression or growth in this field that I'm in for this firm I was at. I wasn't getting paid what I thought I deserved to get paid based off of some other people's salaries and inputs that I got from based off what they were doing for the jobs because I was training people who were getting paid more than I was oh, that's not for right. certain aspects. And on those massive accounts we're handling, like, yeah. come on. And just as a whole, I just didn't find the enjoyment. And it was, it was so funny because I was listening to a Joe Rogan podcast and I just, I have no problems with this. I just left the washroom where I was just like on my phone for like 20 minutes watching a YouTube video, yeah. right? Came back, headphones in, listening to like some Joe Rogan, 
Les Brown motivational speech. And does Joe Rogan not say, he goes, I just, I don't get how people can go to work every day and spend the first 20, 30 minutes of the day on the toilet playing mobile games, just trying to kill their day. And like, I just took the headphones off. I'm like, that's just weird. Yeah, I'm out. Oh, I was shit. like, someone put that there. I was like, that, that's like, uh, that's it's a simulation. Just, that's the one point in my life where I'm like, man, someone's watching me from like above. Like someone's got like eyes on my life right now. So I went to my boss. I'm like, hey, when's like a good time to take like some vacation? And this is like my month and a half in this job, maybe. <laughs> and actually, no, probably two months in. <coughs> and he goes, when were you thinking? I was like, June, maybe. And I think we're April, maybe May, probably May. He's like, how long do you want? I was like, like 10 days. He's like, sure, pick the days. Pick the days, gave it to me. Went home that night and bought plane tickets to Iceland. That night. Because I'm like, I just need to get... I went through a, a, a really rough patch, like personally, on top of being in a job I didn't like. And my life was at like a point where I'm like... Like literally, like I'm at that point where I Something's told you guys... Give. With like, you know, I'm on the verge of the, the job I want, the house, the wife, the family. Like all that stuff is like right there on my doorstep. Like I'm, I'm like, I almost have it all, literally to a T. And I'm like, this isn't what I want though. You know, I, I taken so many steps in my life where there had been positive outcomes based off these actions that I, I had convinced myself that naturally this is the right path to go just because good things are happening. But just because good things are happening, easy things are happening doesn't mean that's the right path. So after a lot of this thing kind of came crumbling down around my feet and I had to kind of hit reset, I picked up and I went to Iceland. I'm like, I got to do some, some soul searching by myself, rented a car, and then just spent seven, eight days driving around the south part of the island. And like, I, the worst part is this is when I was like getting really into photography, barely took any photos, didn't take any video <laughs> because I was just, I was kind of so in the moment that and spending so much time driving, I'd get to these sites and I just kind of would be so overthrown with what had happened in my life over the past two months prior, three months prior. Like I, I literally went from almost having everything figured out right where I feel like it should be. Like I was I was like one of my friends who albeit moved a bit fast, but was at that point where like this is you're at the point now where you just start living your life out. Everything's been lined up, just start living it out. And then I just whew, knocked it all away to hit reset. So I'm in Iceland and I'm trying to figure out like were these the right decisions? Obviously you're feeling this way for a reason. And just spent so much time reflecting. And there's this and I have some photos on my Instagram of, of this Shout out Age Effects Drifter. There it is. Got you. It's this uh and you, you can see it on that account, these two photos. Um it's uh a DC or Naval DC three plane that had a crash in a town called Vic on the south of the island in 1973. I think I saw those. Yeah. It like, was back in like November, was it? Yeah, I posted one in November. Yeah. And then earlier on. I don't know, um, yeah. But uh, what what TripAdvisor didn't tell you is like it's a ten kilometer hike. So, anyways, I, I get out there, and the time that I was in Iceland, the sun didn't set. Right. It would like kiss the horizon, would come back up. It was just, it was just that time of year where it was a constant daylight. So it's 12.30 at night or technically in the morning. And I get up to this plane. I'm the only one there. There was like two people when I got there, but they ended up leaving. So I'm, I'm by myself. You literally, like Iceland is the one place I've been where you don't even feel like you're on Earth. The terrain is so unique. I, I almost felt like I was in a movie, right? Like I was on the set of a movie that took place in a different world. Like it was the closest I think I've ever had to like a spiritual awakening in my life was, was in this moment, this plane. And... I was just like so overcome by emotion yet so much numbness at the same time, right? Like, and it was so quiet that it was almost deafening. Like I almost couldn't hear myself think that's how quiet it was. Now that even to this day, like makes no sense to me. So I took a couple photos of the plane, doing my thing, enjoying my time, super deep in thought. And I turn around to go. I'm looking back towards where my car is. I can't see my car, but I see the, the biggest glacier in Iceland on this mountain in the center of the island or close to the center. And the sun had just dipped below behind it. And then there's this, this, this fiery red-orange glow over the mountain. And the clouds are rolling down. You can see the ice and the, the black sand and the black base of the mountain. They these such vivid contrasting colors. And it's such 
the, the, the sight you see or that I saw there was of such magnitude and like a, a emotional impact to me that like it's almost like everything started clicking that I'm like I can't quite experience or explain the, the feeling I had in that moment but I'm like this is the feeling that I want to have almost every day if possible and I'm not going to get it from my job I wasn't going to get it from my like you know current situation in life where I was at at, at that day all I knew is, is that I loved photography and I loved videography. And as far as I could see from that point, that was my best bet at replicating or achieving that feeling on a day to day basis or, or at least on a more frequent basis. So I finished off the rest of that trip in a bit more of a lighter mood. Um, I came back and my boss was like, How's the trip? And I was like, It was great. You know, I had a blast. Like, it was amazing. He's like, That's great. Ready to get back to work? I was like, Yeah, not so much. And I'd, I'd already typed up my, my resignation letter that I handed to him on my day back from my trip. And it gave him two weeks. I ended up staying off for a month until they could find someone else for, to replace me. But that was a tough month because I knew exactly what I wanted to do after that. Yeah. Um, and then I left that job back in August. August that just passed, actually. And that's when I went full tilt into photography and videography. And that's when I got my, oh, well, I, I got my Instagram account actually probably two, three months prior to that. Okay. And then as soon as I got back from Iceland, that's what kickstarted everything. And then I, I, re, I literally refused to put myself back into a situation where I couldn't do exactly what I wanted to with each of my days. I love that. Yeah. I was very, very into that story. Mm-hmm. I felt like it hit home with me for sure. That was great. You're a great storyteller. Yeah, very thank good. You. Appreciate that. Honestly, I like a lot of our guests have had you know different moments where they they, they come to terms, but in Iceland by yourself, mm-hmm. they're fucking the old. That's yeah. Crash. It's incredible. Let's say you didn't go there. Plane. What yeah. what advice would wow. you give yourself in that moment? Because I mean, like, I, I've knowing been, everything I know now, what would I tell myself back in that moment? Yeah, like what what could you help any of the listeners with? I mean, that's a that's a pretty big moment, and the reason I suggest as much. I've been in similar situations where I'm dying to make the decision mm-hmm. and I've been wrong, but I've, I've, I'll take some pride here and, and, and humbly suggest that I was able to precondition myself yeah. to, to be okay with whatever outcome yeah. kind of happens, you know, like at least know that Ben, you've made this decision, whatever happens, you know, the outcome. So there shouldn't be much surprise shock or anything like that. Yeah. So I was very comfortable with the decision, even though it didn't work out. So I'm, I'm just curious, what would you tell yourself or what would you tell someone else in that? that I would almost say you, you can't allow yourself to be comfortable with the decision because you're not going to grow in comfort. Right. I like that. Like it's very true to, to summarize, I guess uh, a rough period, uh, leading up to this. Um, you know, I was engaged. I'd bought a house everything was going that direction and then it all stopped right and it was, it was my decision right there's a lot of moving factors in, in, in to what happened and how it happened so I had got to that point where so much had happened that I was so tired of things in my life not working out how I wanted it to that I, I couldn't risk erring on the side of caution I knew what, what I what I wanted to do was probably the riskiest and the hardest path, and I knew a lot of people wouldn't understand, and a lot of people wouldn't necessarily be the most supportive or think it was the right choice. But again, I couldn't take the approach of comfort. Mm. I had to get comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortable and really find ways to, you know, when it, when it came down to like even like the most mundane decisions, pick the more uncomfortable of the two. Like, I don't want to go do this because I'm going to meet these people and have to talk to them about this, this, and this. And I just don't want to, you know, subject myself to that. It's like, well, just do it anyways, right? What's the worst outcome? You're going to feel awkward. You might fail, right? That's cool. You know, there's so many lessons to be had in failures, more so than in failures and success, right? Absolutely. And at least you decided to do it. 100%. Which, yeah, I, I can relate. That's where I'm at with it all. I mean, I'm definitely happy of the decisions I've made, even though the outcomes might not be what i first saw yeah that happens yeah it's called life yeah it does happen did it come kind of feel at, at that point you know it wasn't really you didn't have that choice to be made you had to make the riskier choice that was it you know yeah you, you it, it, it got to a point where like all these decisions i've been making up to this point so far haven't been ha- haven't led me to i'll say like sustained happiness or everlasting happiness right so i knew 
not only do I need to make a change, I need to make a big change. And I need to make a change in a direction that I wouldn't have thought to go or that I didn't think was necessarily at that exact moment the right direction to go. Because everything that I I went with, like with my gut, was kind of leading me to not, I don't want to say disappointment, but just more life lessons to, to places that I, I, I didn't really need to be at that point in time. Mm-hmm. So for this decision, I knew it was going to be hard. And again, I, I was... Like as I was starting this process, I applied for the Halifax Regional Police. Where I put my name in, had an interview and everything. But then partway through doing that, on my way to the aptitude test, I was like, no, I was like, you're doing it again. I was like, you're trying to find a practical solution if this doesn't pan out. Yeah. If you fail as a photographer slash videographer, you're trying to find a plan B. You still got that one foot in. Yeah, right? You need both feet to jump in. So... Oh. <laughs> Just flowing. That just crippled me. So you know, and you need both to jump you know, in. That was so quick too. Will Will Smith said it best, right? Plan B distracts from Plan A, right? So I just went with Plan A, and I was like, I'm I gotta not get gonna a have notepad me. out here. Yeah, even my my these, old man too. He's first like, what's your Plan B? And then for the first time, I was like, I don't have a Plan B. He's like, what do you have a Plan B? I was like, I don't have a Plan B. He's like, what if this doesn't work? I was like, it's gonna work. He's like, but it might not. I was like, but it might. I was like, I can't take that chance for it to not work. And I was like, I don't, I've fallen so in love with this craft that, and this is the perfect example I can tell people and and why money isn't happiness. I could do this for free for the rest of my life. And I would still do it with a smile on my face. Yeah, I'd still wake up every morning bushy tailed. I'd still stay up till 1am editing, get up at 5am to go to the gym and start my day off right with not getting paid. I just I love it that much and I'm willing you know this sounds like so cliche but I'm literally willing to die for this like I will starve to death before I go back to a a societal based nine to five job to make ends meet like I will sacrifice everything I have to make this a a success everything is that my Scotia Bank story (laughs) (laughs) Previously known as TD. Yeah, he, he, oh, well, yeah, he beat you. He had a, a job at Scotiabank. Now we can fact check that. It wasn't TD, folks, back in the I had a job at TD, three. too, or TD before. I he had it for TD. two hours. Yeah, oh, yeah. I used TD as the example because I didn't want to toss Scotiabank under, and I felt, I don't know why I felt more comfortable tossing TD under. <laughs> <laughs> one of the big five have what, to go under that yeah, bus. Especially <laughs> whenever I bank with TD. But um, Meanwhile, BMO was like, yeah, what up, guys? Yeah, no, I felt yeah. the exact same way. I was yeah. like, I was talking with my dad on the way in. He's a huge influence on me, mm-hmm. but on the way into the job, and I said, man, if it sucks, like I'll, I'll starve. I'll, I'll live on the street. I don't mm-hmm. care. I'm not doing something I don't enjoy again. Like This has to work sort of mm-hmm. deal. Like This has to be enjoyable. I called him at lunch. He was like, there's no way you're going back. And I was mm-hmm. like, you're right. Like I'd rather, I'd rather starve. And he was like, good luck. You're going to be hungry for a bit. <laughs> and that, that was kind of the kickstart where it was like, okay, now you got to figure it out. But what, you know what? That what hunger you, serves as motivation, right? Oh, right. did it ever. And it it forces great. you to go after it, right? Yeah, I and love it, that. It's amazing what that that mental switch can do for you personally outside of what you're trying to achieve in your work, which which kind of still bleeds in your personal life when, when you're that invested in it, right? It, be, it becomes a part of your persona. It's not just a job at that point. It's, it's literally a part of your lifestyle, mm-hmm. right? And it's amazing after making that switch and just hustling and grinding it out and and putting all that good energy out there, what the universe gives back. Like literally just forcing myself to be more positive day to day based off this this new lifestyle I have. Even something as simple as looking in the mirror and just reaffirming a lot of these things, like which, which a friend of mine had recently told me to start doing, and and I did. Like your days are different. Like I I have like. What do you tell you to do? Just to reaffirm some things you want to do and things oh, I about yourself. I thought that was leading right? up to like a, a motivational a talk in the mirror. Try. In the yeah. morning, just what you want to do, do accomplish during just that time. Just what I want to accomplish and how I'm going to go about it positively. Yeah, like I literally tell myself four or five times a day the same three things about things I want to achieve every single day without fail, and like I'm slowly seeing progressive steps towards those goals. And I, I like it sounds so silly, but I attribute a lot of that to just saying it so much to the point where I, like I, it's one thing to want it, you have to you have to really will it believe into existence. it, literally. And oh, I'm yeah. telling you, the things you can will into existence is it would scare mind-boggling. You. Yeah. You're not the first guest to say that, no. and, it, and it's true. The it, last six months, true. too much has happened for me to not believe that you can will things into existence, and what you put out into the universe, it gives back to you tenfold. Yeah. 
There you go. You just got to be patient and you, you got to work. You can't just throw shit out there and expect it to come back. You still got to chase it, right? So you left it all behind. Yep. What? What, what was next? What you, you knew you wanted to, to get into the photography and videography. Yeah. So so naturally at that point I'm like, okay, I have to start a business, right? So I started a business with, with one of my best friends, strictly videography, right? And I'll be honest, like I didn't put as much time as I should have. And I realized that I was just doing a lot more of the operation side of things just through my own name, through just networking and people wanting odd jobs done. So I started doing that. And I got more and more jobs and then I was contracted out by a company to just do some some cutting and splicing for some videos for the government of Alberta. Just a quick two-day job. And uh, much like you said about the 40-hour work week, like I can finish everything a lot sooner. I, I finished this 48-hour job in four hours on the first day, <laughs> which sucked because they were paying like 400 bucks a day just to be there. And I finished it in the first half a day. So like I lost out on half that money because I'd finished the job much quicker. And then at this point, yeah. I'm still like freshly on the streets trying to, to, to make my living with my camera. And then I'm like, oh, I was like, well, that was great. I was like, but that kind of just fell into my lap. I was like, I don't know where to go from here. And I actually got a call from one of my one of my good friends now, Justin Jackson, who owns and operates a company called Vehicle Approval Center. Shout out JJ. Shout out JJ. And um, essentially, he, um, it's kind of like online car sales, right? You let him know the car you want. He'll find that like through a bunch of affiliate um, dealerships that we work with, like face-to-face uh, they find a car you want at a price you can afford um, with some of the lowest interest rates and they go you just literally tell them what you want and they go and find it for you and they'll send you all the photos and videos they even deliver it exactly to your door and if you don't like it just you can send it back right so you sign nothing until they bring the car to you right so he just called me he's like i'm looking for a content creator so i'm gonna take photos and do cool like b-roll edits of cars just to kind of get out there so people can kind of be more aware of our brand he called me on my lunch break, on my first day at that job, when I finished all the work, and I literally said, what am I gonna do for money, right? It's like, I have no idea what I'm gonna do for money, right? And I'm just sitting like, I, I'm gonna find a way, I gotta find a way, and he had literally, I had forgot that I had added videography on my resume on Indeed like four days prior. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I noticed you do videography. I'm like, is my account public? I was like, yeah, I do. And I met him on my lunch break that same day for a meeting and he's like what would you need to come work for me and I said I need to be using my camera every day I need a flexible schedule so I can still because I told him about my interests of, of my current videography business and the business that I wanted to start and he was so cool with that and then he gave me a more stable stance to pursue this while still you know making money enough to pay my bills and I'm still working with him uh, like usually Tuesday to Friday but Monday to Friday um, doing that now but again it's it's such a flexible job that I can just show up film for a couple hours and edit throughout throughout the week right yeah. and I can still go handle all the other jobs I want to do so it's 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 almost like freelance with just a bit more stable work right and then through that I'm, I'm using my camera every day which is if you're going to be creative I think whether you just take a photo or do a quick video edit, you have to be using it every single day right to keep it fresh in your mind yeah. um, so I've been doing that with him now and that's that's probably been the biggest blessing I've had thus far is is that job that he gave uh, to me. And it, it's progressed to such a point now where we've hired a second uh, creative individual, my, my buddy Liam Coulter from Seattle. Shout out Liam Coulter. Oh, cool. Um, Shout out Liam. I yeah. love that. Um, and like him and I just bomb around now and um, we've partnered with a new dealership so we just go out and we just take videos of cars all day like drone footage some cool cinematic b-roll driving on the highway it's you're, you're almost like shooting small Mazda Toyota Honda commercials every day and it's a yeah. literal blast because through this we're both finding more effective efficient ways to shoot and edit right you're almost doing these mental shot lists of what you need which service you for so many other jobs right and again we still have all that freedom of kind of designing our own schedule with him to be able to go pursue our own freelance stuff and supplement it with that because he's still getting everything he needs from us, right? So that's... Uh, that's it's like a job that. within a job. It's perfect. Yeah. It's like you're hired by someone, you but you make your own schedule. Yeah. It's, I, like, I'm, I'm literally like, I'm still like working for myself basically, right? That's and awesome. It, that's just because he put so much faith into us to deliver what he needs and yeah. we haven't let the guy down yet, right? And he obviously sees value in us. So it's, it's we have a really good thing going right now. Awesome. Yeah. It'd be hard to find something more compatible. Oh, it's insane. Just, well, why yeah. don't we uh, why don't we get into the loud media then? What what's uh, what do you got going on there? Yeah. So I, I met Eric at NSCC. Um, 
he was in the entrepreneurship program while I was in the finance. And there was uh, some sort of competition within the business sector of NSCC where they made randomized teams and you had to do like some pitch in front of a, a panel of judges. You had like 24 hours to find a hack into some sort of industry and how you're going to disrupt it and kind of create a product or service that would fit in. So we were on a team and we we end up winning first in this competition for our idea. Um, not a big deal. Yeah, not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, subtle flex. Okay, keep going. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we chatted uh, and we, you know, we had a couple of meetings about actually making this idea an actual thing, um, which we didn't really do just because we were so busy with life and our other jobs. And then Eric got a job as the general manager of a new gym, O2 Wellness in Bedford. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, and shout he, out O2. They yeah. like our photos. And he was the, the their marketer there too. And then Eric was kind of my and so I did a couple of videos for them. And then eventually, um, you know, Eric approached me about potentially doing this this um, this company, Loud Media. Um, and, you know, he coined the name, which I, I really liked. Um, That's why I'm into it. Yeah, so right now it's just a, a two-person, you know, show. Like I said, he approached me about a year ago with this idea. And um, it's been a lot of back and forth about, you know, before we take the wheels off the ground, how can we make this a success? And we're, we're still ironing out the details before we go full tilt with this as a business, right? Because we yep. want to make sure, you know, we're crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's. So when we take off, like we take off the right way. We don't want to just jump in because this is, in my eyes, this is my end goal, right? This is, I find personally, for me, there is a cap in just doing freelance videography. I'm only going to reach a certain point of stability where I know there's going to always be work there, right? Yeah. With this, this is something that I, I can pour a lot of time and effort in and achieve that longevity and something that I genuinely love and build something that one day could potentially help employ other people, mm-hmm. right? And maybe help them realize some of their goals. So we've slowly been putting the wheels towards that. Um, he's got a lot of experience um, like doing stuff like digital strategy and Facebook ad marketing campaigns and distributing content. And I'm obviously the other side of that puzzle where I, I focus primarily on the content creation. Um, it's pretty great because we collaborate on both aspects. So I'm learning more of the, the SEO and the, the Facebook ad campaign and the, the digital side. And he's learning more about the content creation side. So, you know, when it does come time to start pitching towards clients, you know, it's one thing to, to have both of our expertise, but to be able to know enough about each other's. So if we ever have to kind of one off the meeting or feed off each other, just kind of reaffirm points, we have an understanding, right? So it's not like, um, you know, black and white sides. It's like this one kind of nice gradient from black to white with some nice gray area in the middle where we kind of collectively can pull our thoughts to kind of, you know, tag team a client instead of just hitting them with two random facts yeah. from the size of the tennis court, right? So you got that synergy going. Yeah, exactly. So, and I mean, him and I have, whenever, whenever we get together and we try and get together weekly now as, as we're getting closer to trying to hone in on this, on this business, um, Again, it's much like my, my mentor, uh, Barb, uh, one of my other instructors at NSCC. He's another person DP. that we, yeah, he's another person that when we get together, it just hones in all these ideas I have. And if I start kind of slightly going astray, it just kind of funnels me back into to the end goal. So I, having people like that in your life are, are absolutely crucial. And, you know, there's the old adage they that. They keep you grounded. 100%. Like they always say best friends make terrible business partners, but business partners make great best friends, right? So partnering with someone on a business aspect first who shares mutual goals and ideals ideals that that, that we genuinely believe that we can achieve you know we're just you know every every week forming a strong relationship between the two of us which just makes for a stronger business right mm-hmm. so yeah. again everything we're doing up to this point is just trying to make sure everything is exactly where we need to be to take it off and then when we do decide to take it off and do this full time i mean i'm i'm confident that nothing's going to stop us like, awesome. I mean, we're too good at pitching ourselves, especially as a team. I mean, when you see him and I suited up, you can't say no, man. Come on, right? <laughs> I'm already sold. You don't got to sell me. Yeah. Love that. I'm in. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Lab Media, you heard it here. Yeah. This Everyone is, this is, this is the comeuppance. One of these days, I'll, I'll like be back it. for like another interview in a year's time and we'll we'll recap, right? Yeah. We'll be we'll be forced in the city. Oh, yeah. words. Is your slogan, bring the noise? <sighs> I don't even know if we have a slogan yet. Please don't let it be that. Yeah. <laughs> Great song though. Bring the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Yeah. So that's great. And I think, um, you know, we talked about diving in, but when it comes to getting a business. Is this another Sailor Nautical 
No, no, play no, no. on words. I'm dive not really in. on those nautical mm-hmm. ones, but talking about diving in, and that's so important, you know, with taking that risk and everything like yeah. that. But what you're doing with loud is also so important is taking the time to make sure you cover all your bases. Exactly. And like leaving my job, that was the initial, that was diving into the water, right? Now mm-hmm. I'm at the point where I'm treading, right? Yeah. I want to stay afloat. So at this point, it's not so much of jumping in the water so quick. It's a matter of keeping afloat and, you know, getting my arms up to strength so I can, you know, tread water for the rest of my life. You challenged him. He answered that. Oh, he did. Oh, yeah. baby. Coming at you, man. All awesome. the quick whips. Very afloat. I love it. Well, I, I think Keeping we'll... things above board. We'll probably uh, call things there. I could talk to Matt all night. Honestly, honestly yeah. I mean, was... I could chat with you guys as long as the coffee's slow, man. I could talk right. all night. Yeah, this is a great convo. Yeah. We're definitely gonna have you on for uh, round two. Maybe oh, round three. Ah, that's I've... something I wanted to mention. That um, for any of those folks that are listening, do you do you, do you sense a little bit of history repeating itself? None of these guests that we've had on yet are just satisfied with coming on once. Everyone's oh, no, like, God, no, I want to be back. I want to be, sure. no, no, I'm not, that's not, not a plug for us either. It's, it's no, their you're own. Not your own horn. It's just, it's true. It, it's their internal drive to want more. 100%. It's like, yeah, you think I'm doing well now? Thank you for highlighting me, but have me back in a year. Yes. Because yeah, I'm going to show I'm you that. Yeah. And then it's just like, whoa, like, you're that hungry, you're already thinking about coming back. Like, not to suggest you're thinking about coming back on in a year, but it goes to your point of like, where you're like, yeah, I'm doing well with Lab yeah. Media. I, I'm doing my own thing, but just wait until the floodgates open. Oh, and yeah. And that and they're opening. is a pun. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, if either of you guys take a vacation, man, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> down, I'm, miss that. I'm down to hop in as a co-host, you know, if you guys are, you know, yeah, when you guys want to go to Tahiti or Bali, man, take a week. It's okay. I you got could, you covered. You're a co-captain. You, you could be our host I when... Uh, your first mate. First mate. Because people want I'll us to I'll do an it. episode. Like, someone interview us. Oh, yeah. Potentially I'd, I'd grill you guys, man. Oh, my. That's great. All right. Well, I think uh, I think we'll wrap things up. That was incredible. Want yeah. to thank you again, Matt. No, for thank you guys so much for having me. This was an absolute blast. Yeah. Like we're, we're saying, uh, round two, maybe maybe this summer, this winter, next year. Who yeah. knows? It'll happen. Uh, we can chat forever. Yeah. Something I wanted to start maybe thanking our guests for is is not only thanking them for attending and being part of it, but thank you for like opening up. Yeah. Like I know. I know the challenges associated with that, and we're, we are virtual strangers, so I really do appreciate it. I want you to know that from like a genuine point. It, it's not easy, and I definitely commend you for coming on it and being able to share your story and look inside. Um, yeah, and speak to two strangers so candidly. It's, it's yeah, no, no. Awesome. I mean, like, again, thank you guys for for listening and not hearing, right, and actually giving me good feedback. God, right? This guy. So, yeah. You just think he's gonna sink and he swims. Do we just make a new friend? Always yeah. treading, guys. Always treading. Always treading. Always treading. Always treading. Yeah. That reminds me of. He's throwing his life jacket in. Oh. Well, we preserve this stop. one. Yeah, I gotta stop. Yeah, man. <laughs> All right. No more fun. All right, guys. Um, yeah, I guess we'll see you next week. Thanks mm-hmm. for thanks for listening. Uh, for brand new view, I'm Mark. I'm Ben. And I'm Matthew. Oh. <laughs> we have ourselves together, yes, baby. Uh, see you next time. That has to make it. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I was the same old me with the same old blue. With the same old blue. With the same old blue. I was the same old